Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Tracy, have you wondered, ever wondered, does it matter what you eat if you have cancer <laughs> or if you're trying to prevent cancer? Is there a best cancer-fighting diet? That's another good question. That is a good question. Here to answer those questions is Mayo Clinic nutrition and cancer expert, Dr. John Shin. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Shin, there is some evidence, uh, scientific evidence, linking cancer with what we eat, correct? Yes, there is. Actually, in, in 1981, the U.S. Congress commissioned uh, doctors Dahl and Pito from the U.K. to do a landmark study on this very topic, the avoidable causes of cancer. And what they found in their estimates was that approximately 35% of all avoidable cancers were caused by diet. 35%? 35%. So that's 1981. Ten years after that, Dr. Willett from Harvard uh, University, he actually did a refresh of the numbers and found that his estimates were about 32%, so right about in line from that. And then in 2015, the NCI did another refresh of the data, and they said these numbers are holding generally true for 35 years. So I think the consensus is that approximately a third of all avoidable cancer causes are due to diet. Well, that's a commercial for yeah. broccoli right yeah. there. <laughs> it certainly is. Eat your greens. So, uh, and what about if you have cancer? Uh, is it important what you eat or is it too late? Yes. So it's a question that comes up very often in my clinic. Uh, the moment patients get cancer, the first question they want to know is, what can I be eating to help with my cancer therapy? And it goes to reason that if cancer, if your diet can affect whether or not you get cancer, then surely it can help once you have cancer, and that is indeed what we see. It's fuel to help you fight the cancer. It makes complete exactly, sense. Exactly, exactly. So have you determined or have researchers determined if there is an optimal uh, cancer-fighting diet? Yes, so this is the million-dollar question, right, that everyone wants to know. And there's been a ton of research in this line. And I guess the bottom line story is that the optimal anti-cancer diet <laughs> appears to be a whole food plant-based diet. And I want to unpack that a little bit because the term plant-based diet gets thrown around a lot. And I can tell you that French fries and Oreo cookies are plant-based, <laughs> but no one's going to assume that that's an optimal anti-cancer diet. So the key here is whole food. You want to have, you want to eat plants that are minimally processed. And if you do that in general, you have the key to having a successful anti-cancer diet. And what is it in plants? that is so good. And this is also another hot area of research, and scientists have been looking for that magic bullet that you can find in a plant that seems to confer the anti-cancer properties. The, what we see is that plants are chock full of things called phytochemicals, also known as phytonutrients. That's a fancy term for basically chemicals from plants. And these are polyphenolic compounds, basically the compounds that give plants their rich colors, their bright, vivid oranges and reds and greens that appear to have the most potent anti-cancer properties. And it seems that these chemicals, in synergy with each other, confer the highest anti-cancer effect. So not really in isolation, but they work together like a symphony to create that effect. And because plants are full of these uh, substances and they're not found anywhere else, that is what gives them their health benefits. When it comes to cancer fighting or cancer preventing, um as a former cancer patient myself, I want to know more about the repair, the repair po point that your food as your fuel gives you. Mm -hmm. um, the, are there foods specifically that help you to repair damage? Because chemotherapy is hard on a body. Yes, yes, indeed. And so that's probably the number one motivation that cancer patients have. And so they're thinking about, well, what about a diet to help me detox from chemotherapy? What about a diet to help augment my therapy and make it more effective. And here we have to tread carefully because it you would think that, you know, I just build up on antioxidants and all of these things and it makes sense to do these cleanses and it's going to help me. And and science has shown that that's not always the case. For example, there's a type of chemotherapy called alkylating agent therapy. It's one of the most common chemotherapies given in cancer care, and we found that substances that increase Glutathione, which is basically the antioxidant pathway that you use uh, in your body, can actually work against alkylating agents and make them less effective. So things like turmeric, which has been touted with tons of anti-cancer properties, which 
we all know and believe in. Unfortunately, for patients getting treated with this type of chemotherapy, it can work at cross purposes with their chemo. So I always tell my patients, I'm a firm believer in using your diet to augment therapy, but let's personalize it to the kind of therapy that you're undergoing rather than having a blanket recommendation for all people at all times. So you mentioned that foods may be the cause of up to 30 or 35 percent of the cancers that we get. What are the cancers that you can get or do get from eating unhealthy? Yeah. So unhealthy in general, uh, pretty much every disease under the sun has been associated with an unhealthy lifestyle of which diet is a huge component. But in particular, uh, unhealthy diets, and by that I mean a diet that's full of saturated fats, uh, high in animal protein, uh, filled with all of these you know, chemicals and foods that appear to augment cancer growth. Uh, you've had every major type of cancer associated with those types of foods, from breast and prostate to endometrial, colon cancer, pancreas, gastric, you name it. It's been associated. Gastric meaning stomach. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is it about animal-based foods that uh, may cause cancer or isn't good for cancer patients? Right. And so this is, I have a lot of farmers <laughs> in my, <laughs> yeah, my uh, patient not very panel happy with you. <laughs> who, whose livelihood is based on animal foods, and, I, and they say, well, doc, you know, I raise my cattle in a different way and you know we're, we're not factory farmed and, and all of these things. And I, I tell them a lot of the detrimental effect from animal foods actually comes from the process of how you cook them. So we found that high temperature, and by that I mean above 260 degrees Fahrenheit, appears to create a lot of cancer-causing compounds, things called heterocyclic amines or you know, uh, the, these, these different things that are the result of overcooking meat, essentially. If you have any kind of searing or charring on the meat, you can, you can be assured that you've caused, you created some of these compounds that are actually linked with cancer. And the, the, the evidence is so tight that the World Health Organization, actually the International Agency for Research on Cancer, has issued a statement labeling processed meat as a carcinogen, a cancer-causing agent, on the same line as tobacco and asbestos and things like that. So like, don't char it, and so, eat it rare. Correct, and then so, <laughs> so that I have some patients not say, as often. Right? I have some patients say, "Well, then I will just take my steak and just chew on it raw, and everyone's happy, right?" <laughs> I said, "Well, not so fast, because even in the raw meat, inherent in the meat itself, there are these persistent organic pollutants, uh, such as dioxins, that." by virtue of an animal being higher up in the food chain, kind of bioconcentrates these toxins found in the environment. And there's no way to separate that from the meat food itself. So you have a higher concentration of that if you eat these foods. My last question is about sugar. I have heard uh, sugar linked with cancer. Yes. What do you say to that? So sugar has been studied extensively in its cancer link, and it's only been linked with one type of cancer, which is esophageal cancer. And, but there's no clear link with other cancers. Now, the issue is that a lot of patients, if they have cancer, they get these things called PET scans, where they use radioactive sugar to figure out where your cancer is. And they see that the cancer cells seem to drop these radioactive sugar cells, molecules more than normal cells. And so they say, aha, if I eat sugar, it's going to feed my cancer. Well, everything you eat, if it's a carbohydrate, gets turned into sugar in your body. And there's no way you can starve your cancer cells selectively. And so what I would tell patients is that it's not the sugar itself, but the, what it, the end effect of the sugar. If you take refined sugar and it spikes your insulin, the downstream effects of that can be cancer promoting. Our guest is Dr. John Shin. He's an expert on cancer and nutrition. Time for a short break. But when we come back, we'll, t we'll ask him about superfoods. What are they? And also find out if there are any vitamins or supplements that can help you fight cancer. I think we might even throw some myth or matter of facts at him as well. Perfect. We are with a nutrition and cancer expert, Dr. John Shin of the Mayo Clinic, and we've learned one thing. you got to stick to a plant-based diet. Whole if you want, foods, plant-based. Right. If you want to prevent cancer or if you have cancer, it's a good diet to be on. And by the way, uh, most of the nutritionists and cardiologists that we have on the program recommend the Mediterranean diet. Does mm -hmm. that fit with what you've been saying? Yeah. So the Mediterranean diet is primarily plant-based, and a lot of patients point to it as being a, a diet to emulate. And I think, I think that's wise because we've seen that people who stick to a Mediterranean type diet uh, get a lot of benefit. I do want to also point out though that studies of different types of plant-based diets, Mediterranean being one of them, shows that the majority of the benefit of the Mediterranean diet derives from its large plant-based components. So that's what I would focus on. Does it matter if the food that we eat is organic? 
Ah, so this is another classic question I get from patients, and they say, well, doc, uh, if I don't eat organic, is it even worth eating plant-based? And it is true that inorganic plant-based foods have residues of pesticides and things like that that are so, obviously... So, uh, by the way, what's the difference between inorganic and organic? You use those terms. Explain. Correct. So organic means that you're growing something like you would back in the 1700s. You have no <laughs> access to fancy chemicals to kill off the bugs that eat your plants. You have no access to basically enhancing substances that you wouldn't otherwise be provided by Mother Nature. All right. So that's kind of the easy way to put it. And so well, with modern farming techniques and things, you know, you have all these miracles of um, chemicals that preserve your plants that unfortunately the residues get left on the plant surface. And even though you do your due diligence in washing them, studies have shown that there are residues that still get inside and they're not good for your health. They're meant to not be eaten. So that is definitely a health concern. However, when it comes to the anti-cancer properties of plants, I'm dealing with patients who are saying, doc, I'm just having a hard time eating plants, period. The moment I tell them to eat organic, it's now a lot more expensive and it adds an extra barrier. And studies have shown that, you know what? Eating plants is better than eating no plants. So I tell patients, look, if you can afford to eat organic and, and, and you want to go that way, then more power to you. That's even better. But if you're at the point where you're struggling to just add plants to your diet, just go out and eat plants. Don't worry whether they're organic or inorganic. Just buy plants and eat them. All right. Tell us about superfoods. They're all the rage now. I think they're also called functional foods. What yeah. are they? So superfoods are foods that have been identified as being particularly high in nutrients and nutrients that fight cancer and reverse diabetes and heart disease and things like that. It's not actually an official category. It's more of a marketing term, if you will. And the more and more we learn about nutrition, I think we're going to start labeling more and more foods as being superfoods because right now we focus on things like acai berries and blueberries and sweet potatoes and, and kale. And we say these things are superfoods and they're great foods. But every year, scientists are resurrecting a previous non-superfood saying, well, this is actually a superfood now based on our latest research. So it just goes to show that plants are good to eat. Potato chips, probably not on that. Probably not list. on the superfood list. Of course not. <laughs> All right. Vitamins and supplements. Are there any that can prevent cancer? So this is also a very hot topic. And I can say that there has been no study to conclusively show that there is any single supplement or vitamin that can prevent cancer. Now, in a recent study of meta-analysis of clinical trials, uh, it's been shown that vitamin D has been linked with decreased cancer mortality, but not to decreased cancer incidence. So people still take, who have a you know, high level of vitamin D still get cancer at the same amounts, but fewer of them die from their cancer, and that's being actively studied. Why? Um, but what I like to tell my patients is, you know, instead of trying to focus on that magic supplement or that magic compound that can help prevent cancer or improve mortality, eat the foods that contain those supplements in good quantity. When you are a cancer patient, um, sometimes you it's a struggle to eat anything. I mean, yes. you have mouth sores or you are nauseous or fill in the blank. I mean, there's a lot of things that go along Absolutely. with being treated for cancer. How or what should patients do that are um, going through cancer treatment mm -hmm. to try to maximize the food that they can ingest <laughs> and, and get to stay down? <laughs> and Tracy, I'm so glad that you bring that up because at the end of the day, when patients are undergoing acute cancer treatment, the number one concern is adequate nutrition. You don't have the luxury of talking about, well, let's try to make this, you know, this kind of food versus that kind of food. Are you getting enough calories and nutrition, period? So that is where I keep my conversation. And if they say, you know what, the only thing that tastes good to me is chocolate milk, then I say, you know what, drink <laughs> your chocolate milk, and, and I hope you get enough calories from that throughout the day. Once you get above that level where they're sustaining adequate nutrition, then I take it a step and say, well, let's see if we can improve the sources from which those calories come from. But to give someone who's actively vomiting, nauseous, everything tastes horrible, and you tell them, you have to drink green smoothies. You know? It hurts to eat. Right, or a bowl of kale. That's mm -hmm. just not going to fly. And so it's a stepwise fashion. I, I would suspect that you would not suggest that people who have cancer take vitamin D. You did say that it lowers mortality. It doesn't prevent cancer, but you don't put your cancer patients on vitamin D. So I tell them it certainly doesn't hurt. 
the levels that have shown to be associated with decreased cancer mortality is nowhere near levels of caution in terms of toxicities. Um, it's definitely higher than the 600 international units that's generally recommended for people. It's more on the order of 1,200 to 1,500. And to me, it's perfectly fine. And I leave it up to them. I don't tell them you should do it, but I also don't discourage them because I say the data speaks for itself and we're not sure how it decreases mortality, but hey, everyone can use some more vitamin D. We have one minute left. So let's do some let's do some rapid <coughs> myth or matter of facts. Okay. Breast cancer patients should avoid soy. This and, is a big time myth. Okay. And it actually decreases the uh, risk of breast cancer. All right, juicing can fight cancer. Juicing is very good for your body in a lot of ways, but it's you should treat it as the ultimate supplement. And so I would say juicing gives you a lot of uh, ant, you know antioxidants and nutrients, but you lose the fiber. Better to eat the whole plant. Being a little overweight has no effect on your cancer risk. Well, I would say we know that being overweight has an effect on cancer risk. So being a little overweight has a little effect on cancer risk. So I wouldn't say it's none, but try to avoid being overweight is always the best. Okay, I got my fingers crossed for this one. All right, it doesn't matter what he says. We're not, and if, he, <laughs> if he doesn't agree, all right, drinking red wine is good for your health. <laughs> so they found that the benefit of red wine comes from resveratrol, which is found in the skin of red grapes. So you can drink red wine, or you could just eat the red grapes and avoid the effects of the alcohol, which have proven to be a carcinogen. The bottom line is eat a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant foods, limit consumption of processed meats and red meats, and of course, eat Sorry. lots of fruits and vegetables <laughs> and grapes instead of wine, he said. <laughs> Our thanks to cancer and nutrition expert, Dr. John Shin. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Dr. Shin.